Hi, my name's Erin Voigt, and I'm a blue crab biologist at NC State University. If you've spent any time on the East Coast of the United States, or you enjoy eating seafood from that region, then you're probably pretty familiar with the blue crab. This feisty yet tasty crustacean is a key fisheries species in the Mid-Atlantic and Gulf Coast regions for both commercial and recreational fishermen. While you may be familiar with what an adult blue crab looks like, did you also know that a juvenile blue crab can look like this? Or even like this? Yep, these are all the exact same species of blue crab. The reason these blue crabs look so different is because blue crabs have what scientists call a complex life cycle. This means that they go through several different stages of metamorphosis as they age, similar to a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, or even Pokemon. In fact, the blue crab life cycle is really interesting, and it spans not just different body shapes, but also completely different bodies of water, going from muddy tidal creeks to estuaries and sounds, and even the open ocean. To fully understand the blue crab life cycle, you need to start, like all good stories, at the very beginning. In early spring, male and female crabs will migrate to low salinity muddy waters to try and find a mate. When two lucky crabs find one another and decide to go steady, they will do something called cradle carrying, in which the male crab will latch onto and carry the female beneath him. They do this in order to protect the female as she molts from her immature stage to her mature form. After mating, the lady crab will begin her migration from the low salinity muddy creeks towards the ocean. During this time, she will spawn, or produce eggs, for the first time. In this state, she is often referred to as a sponge crab due to the large, spongy growth of eggs on her abdomen. These eggs can range in color from bright orange, meaning that they are new and therefore full of yolk, to brown, meaning that they are close to hatching. Once the female crab reaches an inlet, or the mouth of the estuary, the eggs will hatch releasing larvae into the open ocean. These larvae are called zoea, and they look like this. The zoea then ride water currents away from the estuary and farther into the ocean. Over the next month, the larvae will grow and molt while riding oceanic currents and eating phytoplankton. After approximately a month, the zoea will metamorphosize into a second body shape, the megalope. The megalope are larger than the zoea and are better swimmers. The metamorphosis into megalopa aligns with the changing of wind patterns from southwestern winds during the summer to northeastern winds during the winter. It also aligns with an increase in tropical storms and hurricanes. The change in wind direction and increase in hurricanes help to push the megalopa west and back into their home estuary. The return of the megalopa to the estuary is referred to as recruitment. Once in the estuary, the megalopa will settle into seagrass beds or habitat along the edge of the marsh. Here they will undergo their last metamorphosis, becoming tiny versions of adult blue crabs called instars. So this is where my research comes into play. I study blue crab habitat in Pamlico Sound, North Carolina, shown here. In this system, juvenile blue crabs use two types of habitat, a seagrass habitat that dominates the eastern shore of Pamlico Sound, and a marsh habitat that dominates the western shore. The habitat along the marsh edge is generally referred to as shallow detrital habitat, or SDH for short, because it's primarily made up of old eroding marsh that's become submerged in shallow water along the marsh edge. While we know a lot about blue crab usage of seagrass habitats, we know much less about their usage of SDH habitats. But previous studies done in the Pamlico Sound have shown that SDH may be just as or even more important than the seagrass in this system. Because of that, my research is focused on comparing the amount of juvenile blue crabs that live in each of these habitats, as well as the total area that they take up in Pamlico Sound. 
To do this, I sample blue crab abundance throughout the sound using either a suction sampler, which is similar to an underwater vacuum, or a kick net, which is basically exactly what it sounds like. Once I'm back in the lab, I measure the size and the amount of blue crabs that I find in each of these habitats. Additionally, I use drones to map the Mars shoreline by taking aerial photographs over the area and then stitching them together into a map. This helps me to understand where the shallow detrital habitats occur and how available they are to juvenile crabs. I hope that this research will help us to better understand the Pamlico Sound blue crab population. By providing information about juvenile blue crab habitat usage, I hope to help resource managers better protect and conserve these habitats. In doing so, I hope to support a sustainable and bountiful blue crab fishery. That way we can continue to fish and eat blue crabs for many years to come.